Hello, I'm John Rossi, a touring drummer with a love of all things animal. When I'm on the road, I visit as many zoos, aquariums... Hey, wait a minute. What's going on? Hey, what's going on there? Hello? Hello? We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you Rossafari Zoo News. News you can use from the world of zoos and conservation. Every week, we bring you breaking news and analysis from around the globe, featuring the animals you love and the people who care for them. And here's your anchorman, John Rossi. Hello, 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 and welcome back to Rossafari Zoo News, your look at all the newsworthy things in the world of zoos, aquariums, conservation, and animal weirdness. I am excited to be here with y'all as we keep on trucking through January. You know, 2022 felt like it was a really fast year for me, even though everything, like literally just everything happened during it. It was it was one of the craziest years of my life. But it was also one of those times where like I looked up in September and was like, what? Isn't it March? And I'm, I'm not usually like that. This year so far, and I fully accept that we are less than two weeks into said year, has been the exact opposite. I feel really calm and really comfortable, and I feel like each day is happening just kind of as it happens. And um, so far, the, these first almost two weeks don't feel weird at all. They just kind of feel like a nice two weeks. And I'm just not really used to that, but I will take it. Uh, hopefully the year keeps on going like that for me and for all of you too. So um, a quick reminder, uh, this is a crowdsourced news program. So if you see any zoo news worthy stories, you can tag me in them at Rossafari on Insta, Facebook, Twitter, at Rossafari Pod on the TikTok. And of course, you can email them to me as well, rossafaripod at gmail.com. So we're going to start off with some interesting uh, recap news about the podcast. Um, the uh, the company that I use to host my podcast is called Buzzsprout, did a year in review that they just released, and um, I thought some of the stats were pretty cool and worth mentioning. So uh, here we go. The Rossafari podcast had 130.1 thousand downloads in 2022. Uh, that puts it in the top 25% of all podcasts that are hosted by Buzzsprout. I released 124 episodes last year, which is insane, but I will say that includes some of the patron like bonus audio stuff. Those are episodes that don't show up for y'all. So it's it's actually not quite that insane, but it's 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 still pretty insane when you think about it. If you listened to all of the content that I put out in 2022, we spent 5466 minutes together. I apologize for that. Um, and yeah, I just, I love it. Uh, there are listeners of Rasafari in 67 countries around the world, with the top ones being the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, Germany, and Canada. And y'all, we got to get those Canada numbers up. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll release something from the Toronto Zoo soon that I already recorded. Maybe we'll do that. Maybe that'll help. And I, I want to get to some other zoos in Canada this year, either, you know, virtual interviews or just get my butt to more places in Canada because it's a very cool place. And then um, last but certainly not least, I have the top five episodes of the year based on downloads. And I will say all of these are from earlier in the year because a lot of people keep finding the podcast and then going back and listening to old episodes. I see it happening all the time and it's it's really cool. Um, so like my episode drumming with Emily, the elephant, uh, does not crack the top five, but it's actually really close already. And that was from uh, September, October, something like that. So yeah, there there is a little bit of wonkiness with these numbers, but um, the top five episodes of the podcast from last year were I Left My Heart in San Diego with Nikki Boyd of the San Diego Zoo and Red Panda Network, The Rossafari Road Trip with Paul Reinhardt of the Cincinnati Zoo, Sea Squirt Zombies with PJ Bevan of Zoo Fit, number two was Pee Your Pants in Private with Tammy Ware and Colleen Adams of the Cincinnati Zoo, 
And number one was Lemur Butts with Dr. Lydia Green of the Duke Lemur Center. And y'all, Dr. Lydia Green is going to be back on the podcast very soon. We already recorded that episode. And as a matter of fact, she's only part of the team that's on there because her lovely wife, who we talked about a lot on that episode, was willing to join us as well, despite the fact that she is very, very shy. Uh, Hearing their energy together was, frankly, adorable. And uh, I'm really excited to share all of that with all of you. One final note, and I know that this is something that you're really going to care about. This isn't podcast related. Um, This this is just a really bad pivot. But uh, I just wanted to let all of you know, because I know you're following along intensely with my Pokemon journey, and uh, I have completed my Pokedex in Pokemon Violet. So that means I have caught 400 different types of Pokemon, all of the ones currently available in the game. I know, I know. I know. I am a rock star. Okay, okay, enough of me being a goofball. Let's get to this. All right, y'all, we're going to start off with a sad one. Um, I know that last week we had Colleen Adams on to announce that Isla and Sal, the Tamanduas at the zoo, had a pup. And unfortunately, the pup has passed away. Uh, There is no known cause of death at this time. Necropsy results take a long time. Uh, But what we do know is that Isla was raising the pup and appeared to be doing a very good job. You can't always tell, but from watching cameras and everything, she was an attentive mother. It seemed as though pup was um, nursing. And so this came as a a big shock to the team. Colleen and, um, I mean, man, over the years on this podcast, You've heard from Colleen. You've heard from Mark. You've heard from Tammy. Um, They're all just devastated, you know, and onward they go and they will learn from this and they will will hopefully figure out what happened and the community at large will just end up doing better and having more knowledge. But uh, this is a real sad one, y'all. So our love goes out to everyone at the zoo, especially on uh, the animal ambassador team. All right, but I don't want things to be all doom and gloom, so I'm going to now share one of my favorite things to share recently from uh, the Cincinnati Zoo, which is, yet again, Fiona the Hippo's armchair zookeepers uh, have been at it. And as such, um, one of the team needed to go into the Fiona the Hippo group and say, the object that you see floating in the water at Hippo Cove is a log. It is used as an enrichment item for the bloat. They have used them in the past, and the hippos really seem to enjoy it. Yup, 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 yup. People are complaining because the hippos have a log for enrichment. So, uh, yeah. Um, I actually liked one of the people uh, commented and said, Hey, Susie, what do you do in your free time? Well, believe it or not, I spend most of my time explaining to a hippo bloat obsessed group of about 250,000 people that the hippos aren't in danger and they aren't dying and that what is going on in their enclosure is normal. Uh, Following up by saying we appreciate you and all the time you spend with us. And yes, that is true of all of the keepers who dive into uh, this whole situation. I will never not find it amusing. It's extra funny because Fiona is just so amplified to me. But um, yeah, don't don't worry, y'all. I think the Cincinnati Zoo knows a little bit more about how to take care of hippos than uh, the average weirdo sitting on the internet. Crap, I'm an average weirdo sitting on the internet, aren't I? And actually, we're just going to keep it in Ohio for a minute uh, because also this week, the Cincinnati Zoo said thank you to the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium because Allie, an 18-year-old aardvark who lives at the Cincinnati Zoo, was having some medical issues and the vet team at the zoo thought that a blood transfusion was the best way to save her. So the Columbus Zoo vet team quickly jumped into action and then uh, were able to get enough blood from their aardvark to send to the Cincinnati Zoo. The transfusion was a success, and Allie is now doing much better. She still has a lot of recovery to do, but the prognosis is good, and it just, it looks like they've saved this aardvark's life by doing blood transfusion work. This is incredible. I love zoos so much, and I love seeing, like, zoos that are kind of close to each other collaborating so much. 
And speaking of the Columbus Zoo, they recently opened up a new experience that you can sign up for. Although, spoiler alert, um, all of the available slots sold out almost immediately. However, you can now go to the Columbus Zoo and uh, for a, a bit of a donation, of course, go and give an elephant bath to Frankie the elephant. Well, help give one anyway. Um, you both get into a really large tub and they fill it with what? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. They are protected contact, of course, but uh, you get to be hands on and help wash and feed through protective barriers. Frankie, the baby elephant. And uh, like I said, the experience sold out basically immediately. However, uh, since it is being successful, assuming it actually goes well when the experiences start, I'm sure the zoo will release more dates. So keep your eyes on at Columbus Zoo on Facebook and Instagram. And uh, if that's something you'd like to do, as soon as you see it pop up, go and reserve your spot. And while you're there to wash an elephant down, uh, you can also go over to the Australia section to see the uh, koala joey that I mentioned being born there recently. Um, so uh, this joey has been named. She is a female. And her name is Cora, which is extra adorable because you may remember that this is the koala Joey koala that um, was born to Katie, the mom there now, and Thor, who was the uh, the father who uh, passed away before the Joey was born. So Cora is a mixture of their two names. And I just think that's really cute and a nice way to honor uh, the father's legacy. So nice job at the Columbus Zoo like always. And since I'm staying in the general geographic area that we're talking about here, I might as well mention that the Pittsburgh Zoo has a new name, kind of. So uh, for the long time, we've always just kind of referred to it here as the Pittsburgh Zoo. That's what most people call it. But the full name of the facility was the Pittsburgh Zoo and PPG Aquarium. However, it seems like PPG has pulled their sponsorship or something. Um, that seems to be happening in Pittsburgh right now since uh, Heinz Field, the uh, Steelers stadium for the longest time, uh, lost their Heinz name and now became something like Arkreshore or something. I don't, I don't even know what it is because um, Steelers fans hate it. And literally on their social media posts showing the the, the pictures of the stadium, they they block off the name, which is hilarious. Um, but yeah, so uh, the Pittsburgh Zoo is now just the Pittsburgh Zoo and Aquarium. PPG is no longer in the name. Not a real exciting name change, but one worth mentioning all the same, mainly because I got to make fun of Steelers a bit. Yay. All right, so I'm starting to feel like I should just record this story once and then um, drop it in every week. But the Oakland Zoo has, yet again, rescued another mountain lion cub. This one was found near Santa Cruz in California, and um, there was no mother nearby. So Hazel, the name of this one, was taken to the Oakland Zoo's veterinary hospital for treatment. Um, Hazel seems to be out four or five months old and was found severely emaciated, suffering from anemia and hypoglycemia. Uh, she got fluid treatment and was set up with a warm and cozy overnight bed and uh, vitals had already started improving the next morning. Obviously, you never know what's going to happen, but um, the Oakland Zoo has just become a bastion for stranded mountain lions, and it is the coolest thing to see. I cannot believe that I am reporting on this two weeks in a row. It's it's just so awesome to see. Um, and while we're on the subject of the Oakland Zoo, uh, they are in the process of um, redoing their sea lion exhibit. And as such, Xander and Pearl, two of the sea lions that live at the Oakland Zoo, have traveled all the way to the Memphis Zoo to hang out with uh, the sea lions there. And they are now hanging out in the sea lion pool and uh, they are on exhibit. So it's, it's going really well. And yet again, just a great example of a couple of zoos collaborating together to make life better for all of their animals. Next, I want to share a couple of stories out of the Oklahoma Aquarium, and uh, I'm really, really excited to share this first one because this is a different story than we usually do 
on Zoo News, but it's it's really cool. So Dr. Ann Money, who appeared as a guest on the podcast and who is the head honcho there at the aquarium, um, posted something recently, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna share about it and hope that's okay because I didn't ask permission. But um, she posted on her private Facebook page, we're, we're friends, um, that uh, she needs to brag on Lolly Moore Emig. Now, Lolly is the digital and marketing strategist at the Oklahoma Aquarium, and um, she's the person who, when I reached out and said, hey, I'm driving cross country and would like to stop and do an interview, set it up and made it happen with uh, Anne, and also uh, told me that she's really in love with Rockabilly and all that kind of stuff, and we we super bonded over that, that weird connection that we both have. Well, it turns out that Lolly is a member of the Junior League of Tulsa, um, which is a a volunteerism organization uh, that trains civic leaders and works with community partners to address and solve pressing issues like fighting poverty and education inequality in the Tulsa area. Lolly was recently named the Junior League's incoming Director of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging, a role that will help oversee programs and initiatives to promote equity and education in the Junior League of Tulsa and in her community. Uh, she's also been placed with the Junior League of Tulsa's Board Fellows Program in partnership with a group called Leadership Tulsa. It's a two-year commitment that focuses on developing strong board skills and connecting with stakeholders in the community, something that is wildly important for changing anything, conservation or, you know, anything. Um, and she does all this while also uh, really bringing a huge, awesome presence to the aquarium that just gives it a lot of life and vibrancy. And um, Lolly was an incredible person to meet, and Anne was an incredible person to meet, and I loved hanging out at the Oklahoma Aquarium with them both. And, you know, first of all, Lolly, congratulations. You're awesome, and this is a really cool honor and achievement for you. But also, for Anne, I need to say, the fact that you post this stuff and that you lift people up and that you you take care of the people who work at the aquarium with and for you is just awesome to see. This is what leadership is all about, and I just, I loved seeing this post so much. So, sorry to have pulled it from Facebook, but I want the world to hear about this. And actually, while we're hanging out at the Oklahoma Aquarium, I will also tell you that they are currently involved in testing some shark bite resistant swim gear. Uh, which I think is is pretty cool. Uh, both Oklahoma State University and the Oklahoma Aquarium are being used to test gear uh, that will hopefully help people not you know, get injured so much from shark bites. Um, you may remember from the episode that uh, the Oklahoma Aquarium has a lot of bull sharks, and so they are now being used to test out this product that will hopefully save the lives of swimmers and such. It is very light gear, and the returns have been good so far. So uh, the sharks don't seem to mind it at all. They're obviously doing fine, and uh, now are not only ambassadors, but are also helping being humans to, uh, you know, discover ways to help cut down on human animal conflict when it comes to sharks and people. Zoo Tampa's David A. Stratz Jr. Manatee Critical Care Center, one of only four centers of its kind in the United States, recently announced the release of Pebbles and Corduroy, two manatees who uh, had been in for rehab for 36 years months combined and are now able to go back out into their native environment and hopefully live and thrive. We all know that manatees are having lots of issues right now. So uh, this is just a, a great example of Zoo Tampa doing something amazing for the, the animals that can be found around there in the wild. All right, now we're going to hit a couple more sad stories. Uh, so the Rolling Hills Zoo in Salina, Kansas, recently announced that their one-year-old southern white rhino named Augustus, or Gus, uh, has passed away. 
Gus was the picture of health and very playful uh, until just recently when he started exhibiting neurological type symptoms and uh, they continued to present over the next couple of days. The veterinary staff um, did everything they could to figure out the cause of the symptoms and reached out to veterinarians and rhino experts across not just the country, but the entire world looking for anything like this, any other, you know, examples of this happening or any suggested cure. And none came in. No one really knew uh, what was going on. And unfortunately, his quality of life declined so quickly that they decided that they, uh, the only thing to do was to humanely euthanize. So Gus is no longer with us. And there is still a mystery out there as to why that is the case. Hopefully it was some weird fluke type thing. And uh, the necropsy will confirm that. But yeah, uh, condolences to everyone at the Rolling Hills Zoo. Condolences also go out to the Kansas City Zoo, who just announced the loss of their 33-year-old polar bear, Berlin. Now, um, I, I just said 33 years old, and in case you're wondering, uh, this is the oldest polar bear in human care in the United States, and it is believed to be the case in all of North America. So obviously, Berlin, um, you know, lived a very long life and was taken very good care of by, by the staff of the Kansas City Zoo. Uh, Berlin was actually born at the Cincinnati Zoo back in 1989, right after the Berlin Wall fell which is why Berlin was named Berlin. Uh, back in 2012, Berlin was residing at the Lake Superior Zoo in Duluth when the zoo flooded, and she actually became pretty famous for swimming the perimeter wall of her habitat until uh, staff arrived and discovered her swimming there. They were able to safely get her out, and uh, because she was so strong and resourceful, uh, along with the, the fast actions of the staff, it saved her life. Uh, she briefly went to the Como Zoo there to, to live while they uh, were clearing up Lake Superior, and then in 2012 moved to Kansas City. It is a sad day to lose a polar bear. I feel horrible for the, the staff at the zoo, especially those who have worked with her for a long time. But again, this is just another, you know, happy, sad story because what a testament to the care given to Berlin that she had such a long and incredible life. And while we're sticking with the sad news, uh, a zookeeper um, in Uzbekistan uh, who worked at the Andijan Zoo has died after being mauled by a brown bear in his care. Surveillance video of the entire mauling, including the man's death, has been released. I don't recommend going and looking at it, but um, it is out there. Uh, this was a zoo that had no accreditations and was a private zoo, and it looks like it had some um, lower quality facilities and single locks for a brown bear, which seems kind of crazy to me. Um, and so, you know, I, I mourn the loss of a zookeeper and a man who probably was just doing his best to take care of an animal. But I also mention this story because it is important to remember that there are good zoos and there are bad zoos. There are accredited zoos and there are places barely skating by. And uh, there's a big difference between those types of facilities. Um, so, yeah, I know I have a lot of new listeners and I can't stress this enough, but um, when you see a story like this, it is important to not only, you know, mourn the situation and know that like something like this could happen at any facility. You know, animals in captivity are still wild animals, lions or lions, whatever. But um, at the end of the day, it's worth looking at what kind of facility these types of things happen at. And um, yeah, this is just a really sad example of something that shouldn't have happened because zoos like this shouldn't exist. And I know some people may say that sounds insensitive and a life was lost and that should be the focus of this discussion. But, um, you know, I'm not trying to be insensitive uh, and a life was lost. But again, why was the life lost? I think it's important to learn from things like this. All right, let's cleanse the palate from the sad stories with a couple of happy births. The Chester Zoo has announced the birth of a Western chimpanzee, which is the world's rarest chimpanzee. Uh, they are a critically endangered species, so every birth matters. And it seems like the baby boy is currently in good health and has bonded well with its mother and the rest of the troop. So congrats to everyone at the Chester Zoo. 
The Maryland Zoo in Baltimore recently announced the fifth African penguin chick that hatched at Penguin Coast this breeding season. Breeding season is not over yet, so there may be even more to come, but it is always great to see more endangered penguins being born at the Maryland Zoo, which has an incredible penguin exhibit, by the way. And the Lincoln Park Zoo has announced that Zari, one of their lionesses, gave birth to three lion cubs. Uh, Zari's maternal instincts kicked in right away, and she has been being a great mother, tending to all of them. And all three cubs are active and have begun to nurse, which uh, is really important. So, yay that. Birch Aquarium at Scripps recently announced that one of their female weedy sea dragons transferred eggs to a male, the first time this has ever been successful in the sea dragons and seahorses exhibit at the aquarium. Now, there's no guarantee that any of the eggs will hatch, but this is still a huge milestone for uh, the sea dragons at the aquarium. And actually, only a handful of aquariums have ever successfully bred sea dragons. So even just getting the transfer is really rare and exciting, and hopefully it'll get to the next step. Wildlife Safari has announced the birth of four cheetah cubs to mom Paka, and uh, these are the first cheetah cubs born in 2023 in the entire country. Wildlife Safari is amazing at cheetah breeding, so this is not surprising. Yorkshire Wildlife Park has announced the first ever litter of Maine wolf pups to be born at the zoo. It is a litter of five, and they are doing really well. It's four boys and one girl, and they are adorable. Highly recommend you go to at Yorkshire Wildlife Park to see pictures of these adorable puppies. And last but not least in uh, birth news this week, the Greenville Zoo recently announced the birth of a baby colobus monkey uh, to Mother Nuru. The baby has been staying close to mom, so they don't know the gender yet. But one thing that's really interesting is that um, colobus monkeys are born all white, and then they gain their black and white fur as an adult. So if you would like to see an all-white colobus uh, baby, then you can, can see that at the Greenville Zoo. I love it so much. And by the way, for those of you keeping score at home, this means that we have brand new monklets, wolflets, cheatlets, sea draglets, <laughs> I really like that one, lilets, penglets, and a chimplet. Love it. Local public schools in Norwalk, Connecticut, have teamed up with the Maritime Aquarium to open the Marine Science Academy at Brian McMahon High School, and um, they just received $1.3 million in federal funding to keep their program going and create a kindergarten through 12th grade marine science pathway at Jefferson Marine Science Elementary School and West Rocks Middle School. Uh, this is just a really cool kind of STEM thing, you know, it brings in animals and, and science. And I just, I just love hearing about facilities like aquariums partnering with, you know, local schools. And this is a really big deal. Getting federal funding shows just how amazing this program is. And that brings us to presentation, presentation, news time. Oh yeah. All right. So there's a whole lot of new technology and cool innovations in uh, conservation news this week. So um, in the Tully Block region of Botswana, uh, wildlife rich national parks and game reserves that take care of animals such as leopards, brown hyenas, spotted hyenas, and a very large elephant population, both in terms of numbers and in terms of the fact that elephants are very large. You're welcome. I'm here all week. Anyway, um, there's a company there that uh, is named Smart Perks. It is a Dutch company, and they have developed and installed low-power sensors that transmit radio data back to a central station that rangers are stationed at. This data is used for tracking animals, but is also actually able to um, alert rangers to poachers and their vehicles because they give off such unique signals. And um, because of that, they're able to cut way down on poaching, which is obviously awesome. 
Meanwhile, other conservationists, including the Biodiversity Group, are looking to try to rediscover the Zugs monitor lizard. This is a monitor species that hasn't been seen in over 40 years. And so the Biodiversity Group, along with their partners, are working on a new technology that will use a drone to literally suck DNA out of the air to try to find DNA strands in the air from this lizard and thus be able to find the actual lizard itself. And unlike in years past when they have done different types of DNA testing, not only are they sucking it out of the air, but they will be able to sequence the DNA right there in the jungle because of a clever device that Conservation X Labs is developing. So between the new drone from the Biodiversity Group and the new uh, device from Conservation X Labs, they're actually going to be able to focus their efforts on a very small area, do the sequencing right away, and try to find the lizard in question. Now, the only problem with this is that they need to raise $10,500 by February 22nd to actually get this technology produced. So if you are interested in helping out with this, go check out the Biodiversity Group on Facebook. It's an awesome organization. Uh, this has been vetted by some people who I love and trust. And uh, yeah, this is a really cool cause. And while it's not a new technology, uh, a new film has been made by two students, um, Kate Baum and Ryan D'Souza, uh, and it is called White Gold. It was produced in partnership with Penguins International, and it exists to teach people about the guano issues facing penguins and about the uh, Punta San Juan uh, program that um, is helping Humboldt penguins with, uh, you know, fake nest boxes and stuff like that. So uh, this film was made last year and just won the uh, Best Student Film Award at the Vegas Shorts 2023 Film Festival. So congratulations to everyone involved, and hopefully this film can get some distribution and spread the word about this incredibly important issue that you've already heard a lot about on this very podcast. And Instagram is also getting used in a neat way for conservation right now. Uh, there's this place called At Raw Safari where you can – oh, no, wait, no, wait. You already know about me. Uh, no, actually, I just thought this was really cool. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio recently posted a big post all about the uh, juvenile and hatchling pink iguanas on Isabel Island, um, which we talked about very recently on Zoo News. Uh, this is a species that is uh, endemic to the Galapagos and only lives atop Wolf Volcano. And it's it's very rare to see. It's been a long time since juveniles were seen at all. But we talked about this. But the cool thing is that Leonardo DiCaprio posted about it and, and posted pictures, and he even made it a point to thank places like the Galapagos Conservancy, Island Conservation, the San Diego Zoo, the Houston Zoo, North Carolina State University, and more. It's awesome to see celebrities sharing a good conservation message and thanking zoos in the process. The U.S. Department of Agriculture has given tentative permission for farmers to start using a bee vaccine. Uh, this is a vaccination against foul brood disease, which is one of the diseases that can uh, ravage an entire uh, hive and therefore is very deadly for honeybees. And as I'm sure you know from listening to the podcast, uh, honeybees are in a lot of trouble right now. And they're, they're really important animals. We, we love them and we need them and we need them to not die. So now we can vaccinate them uh, against foul brood. Um, testing has proven to be pretty good so far. And uh, like I said, it is it is a short term tentative approval, but uh, it looks like a really promising thing. And, and at this point, anything that can help our bees is a really good thing. So we should be really excited about this fact. Many years ago in Kansas, bison were wiped almost entirely from the plains. And uh, with over 99% actually of the population disappearing, a lot of changes happened to the environment. 
Um, so a few decades later, uh, they were reintroduced. There was a population of bison that were reintroduced in places like Kansas and such. And now, after decades of study, scientists have found that the plant biodiversity doubled because of the reintroduction of bison. Think about that for a second. Uh, it might almost surprise you, right? But we always talk about how everything in the environment is interconnected, right? We mostly talk about it with humans and animals, but, but it goes way beyond that. And so in this case, bison are incredible grazers. And the plants that they're most likely to graze on are the ones that are the most abundant and take up the most space and can actually kind of crowd out other plants that could live in the area. Also, bison are big and furry, so seeds can attach to their bodies and then get distributed elsewhere. So um, those two elements combine mean that bison not only clear the the path for these new seeds to grow, but also disperse the seeds in the areas that they are eating. So it turns out that by bringing back bison, by bringing back animals that, you know, we think of as eating plants, not saving them, uh, we ended up actually seeing a full doubling of the biodiversity in plants in the plains there. The study further showed that the extra plants and the biodiversity actually helped reduce the impact of major floods. So just a lot of cool things all from bringing bison back. Maybe like letting animals go extinct isn't the best idea. And speaking of interconnectedness and the importance of biodiversity, a study out of the Smithsonian has shown that uh, there is a big problem going on for birds right now. It turns out that insect-eating birds uh, in particular are not breeding nearly as much as they used to in certain areas of the country, including in the Washington, D.C. and Virginia region. Why is that, you ask? Well, it's because of a lack of bugs that are high in protein and are the best things to feed to their young. Okay, so that begets the next question. Why is there a smaller number of bugs? Well, it turns out that more and more people in this area are bringing in non-native plants to use for their gardening and to look pretty and to be cool and funky and unique. And unfortunately, these non-native plants are useless to the native insects. So the native insects go away, which impacts the ability of birds to breed and feed their young. So by bringing in pretty cool foreign plants that, that don't really belong in the area, you're not only taking out the plants that could be living there instead, but you are impacting the insect population and the bird population. And it's extra interesting because this is actually an area that has a lot of birders and a lot of people who love to brag about the birds in their backyard. Bird feeders sell like crazy in this area. My mother always tells me what she's looking at when she calls me. Hi, Mom. So, yeah, it's it's a really interesting look at how all of this is interconnected and how important it is to let some natural, wild, you know, local plants stick around. I'm a big fan of the whole idea of rewilding everything. I think we all need to stop cutting our grass so often and stuff like that. But, you know, I'm just a long-haired hippie freak except for the lack of long hair and the fact that I'm really not a hippie because, like, I own, like, seven drum sets. And, um, well, I mean, the freak part is kind of undeniable. But, yeah, so uh, just something to think about as you are planning out the plants in your backyard. And that brings us to... It's time for other news. It's time for other news. Hey, no, right now, right now, it's time. It's time for other news. Hey, it's a segue to the park on other news. And speaking of nifty birds, a photographer in Tennessee recently came across a yellow cardinal. It looks just like red cardinals, except it's yellow. The uh, bird has unofficially been named Woodstock and is absolutely adorable. I highly recommend that you look up pictures of the yellow cardinal because it is a very rare but very cool bird. 
paleontologists have discovered the biggest otter ever, and this one is the size of a lion. Can you imagine that? An otter the size of a lion? Uh, experts say that the otter would have weighed around 440 pounds. 440 pounds of adorable, playful otter. I cannot even imagine how awesome this creature would have been. And our friends at the Gray Fossil Site have discovered a new, though extinct, species. It is the horned painted turtle, which is an extinct relative of modern painted turtles, and it looked very similar to regular painted turtles that we all know and love today, but there were a bunch of horn-like points at the front of the shell above where the head is, and it's just really cool to see. This is uh, actually the third new species of fossil turtle that has been identified at Gray, and if you don't know what I'm talking about with Gray because you're a newer listener, go back to the first season and learn about the Gray fossil site about the red pandas that existed in North America and why Tennessee U-Hauls have red pandas on them. Oh, animal, oh, animal, animal holidays. Animal, oh, animal, animal holidays. Hey! Well, we are still in the ramp up to having a lot of different animal holidays. So yet again this week, we only have one actual animal holiday, if you can even call it that. The 16th of January is Appreciate a Dragon Day. I'm going to go ahead and say that you should appreciate Komodo dragons and bearded dragons and all the other cool dragons like that. I don't think that's what it's meant to be, but I think we should do it anyway. Uh, it is also Martin Luther King Day and uh, Civil Rights Day. And that's all very good stuff, too, though it's not animal related. However, I will say this. January 17th is Betty White's birthday. And as I'm sure you all remember, Betty White was a huge champion for zoos and conservation. She especially loved her home zoo, the Los Angeles Zoo. And so... On Tuesday, January 17th, I want to encourage all of you to think about your favorite home zoo or aquarium and make a donation to them to honor Betty White. I think we should be doing this every year. I think this should become an official thing. I remember talking to people about this last year when when this was a thing for a whole, you know, minute. But um, yeah, I think we need to bring this back. And so uh, I am encouraging every zoo out there to remind people of this. I am encouraging every zoo fan out there, even if it's just a $5 donation, go give a little something something to your local zoo. Let them know that you love them and let them know that it is in memory of Betty White. So there you have your animal holidays, your non-animal holidays, and your proposed conservation holiday for the week. <laughs> proposed conservation holiday. Good job, John. No one ever said it better. So there you have it, folks. Another week of Raw Safari Zoo News is in the books. I would like to say thank you to my Red Panda-level patrons, Laura Shank and Kristen Dickey, and to remind you all that you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month by going to patreon.com slash Safari. I'd also like to say thank you to everyone who contributed stories to this week's episode. Big breath, because there are a lot of them. <gasps> Anya Keen, Colleen Lenahan, Kim Cooley, Carrie Kirkpatrick, Kevin Williams, Kristen Khalil, Marianne Rossi, Emily Rockbuck, Robert at Hippie Ape, Laura Shank, and Dr. Zoe Rossi. And uh, yeah, you know, I'm still thinking about this. And, and Tuesday, Betty White Day, let's make this a thing. Go, go and give a couple bucks to the facilities that are either your home facilities because they're close to you or are your home facilities because they, uh, they have a special place in your heart. And uh, remember, friends, the words Newsy Credits Backwards are Steiderk Yiswen. The Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. 
You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Rossafari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Rossafari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.